anything except Jesus, right? That's it. So where I want to start this week, we're going to do a quick little recap. Um, we've talked about the first rebellion. That's the one we're the most familiar with, the rebellion in the Garden of Eden, right, where the serpent comes in Genesis chapter 3 and, and tempts Eve and then tempts Adam, and they give in and they disobey God, and that is the first time that sin comes into the world. Rise in, in Genesis chapter 3. We're familiar. Everybody's familiar with that story. When we think of the fall, when we think of sin, and, and we think of it coming into creation, that's what we think of. What we don't think of nearly as much that they would have, that Jews and people in Israel would have thought about when Jesus was growing up is the second fall in Genesis chapter 6, verses 1 through 4, which we've talked about a lot in here. So I'm not going to go back over all the details of that, but you remember, right, the sons of God see the daughters of man, they rebel against God, they cross that boundary from spiritual to created, and they have uh, children with the daughters of men that become the Nephilim. When these Nephilim die, and this is what we talked about last week, their spirits, since they're neither human spirits and they can't go down into to Sheol or into the, the, the realm of the dead, and since they're not pure of the spiritual realm, they can't go to heaven, they're stuck here. And right, we kind of covered a lot last week that they are the evil spirits, the unclean spirits, the demons of the New Testament, right? All result from that second fall, which Jews around the time of Jesus would have thought had much more to do with the decay. Now, they would have recognized the problem with Adam and Eve, and they would have seen sin coming into the world there, but they would have seen that second fall as what really brought the sickness and the death and disease and the world began to decay right, as seen by, by the evil spirits that were unleashed because of this kind of unholy union. The third fall, right, we only think of one fall, but in Genesis, there's really three, because every time we talk about a fall, we're not just talking about people falling into sin, we're talking about rebellious members of the, of the divine council. So, so the first one was the serpent, the second one were, were the, the uh, sons of God, the members of the divine council that had children with the daughters of men. The third one is one we don't think about as often. And next week, we're actually going to come back and talk a little bit more about this. But you may remember the Tower of Babel, right? People were building this tower up to God. And according to the text, they were making good progress. And God said, you know, they're making good progress. So we're going to go down and we're going to confuse their language and scatter them all over the earth, right? We, we all remember that. We remember that story. We're actually going to come back next week and talk about in the New Testament, there's a really important passage that, that we actually talk about that's a reversal of Babel, but we're not going to talk about that this week. That's just a teaser for next week. Um, but God uh, basically spread them out, uh, confused their language, and set the borders of these different nations. Um, sorry, I had my wrong, I had the wrong uh, document pulled up there. So this is why he, God basically he scattered them, then he appointed members of his divine council to rule over these different nations that he had scattered. They subsequently rebelled, led the nations astray, essentially enslaving them, and this is why God chose Abram and Sarai to make a nation out of nothing to become his own people. Now, you may be thinking, Grant, okay, it took, took long enough to get behind this whole Genesis chapter 6, 1 through 4 about that divine rebellion, and we had to do all this background, and now you're going to spring something else on us that is just not like anything that I've ever heard. Well, well guess what? We're going to take a little bit of time and go through some of the Old Testament background before we get to what this looks like in the New Testament. Now, it would be nice if there was one chapter or one book of the Bible that explained this, but there's not. So what we have to do is actually take several passages and kind of string this together. And when we look through the way the Bible presents this, we can see this pretty clearly, right? So we're going to start probably... And if there is a passage to become familiar with this worldview, it would be Deuteronomy chapter 32, 
So kind of when you get a chance, now go home now. I warn you, you'll need to read that out of the ESV, the English Standard Version, or out of, I think, the NRSV, because there is a translation problem that was only cleared up when they found the Dead Sea Scrolls. So there's a mistranslation in 32.8, but, but uh, the, the, the top scholars here have both kind of, and the, ES, the, the interesting thing with the ESV, if you know much, the English Standard Version is a translation by very conservative scholars, probably one of the best, if not the best, conservative translation of the Bible. And then the NRSV is probably the best translation by more liberal scholars. Now, you may be thinking, now let me tell y'all, this is a little bit of an aside, um, why I don't know that it matters who translates it as much, and actually you might even prefer a Bible translated by more liberal scholars, um, because the conservative scholars, evangelicals, right, they have strong faith commitments. And so when they're translating like the ESV that's translated by very conservative scholars, they have these strong faith commitments, and it's hard for them not to kind of translate according to their their leanings according to what they think the Bible teaches that might be different from us and even different from each other. But when you've got real liberal scholars, like the people that translate the NRSV, they don't care what the text says, right? They don't have as many, and I'm, I'm, I'm using hyperbole. I don't mean to say they don't care. <laughs> they, they do care. They have their own beliefs about the text, and they're, they're good Christian folks, even though they have a, maybe a different understanding of God's Word than we do. But since they are not as caught up in a literal word-for-word type translation, and they don't have the same commitments to the text, they care more about what the Greek and the Hebrew says than they do about their own convictions. Does that kind of make sense? So, like, I think sometimes we get an actual better translation because people don't feel the need to make the Bible say something right? They just translate what they read in the Greek and the Hebrew. But anyway, those are probably the two best, two, two of the most scholarly translations, most updated, and they have this reading that I'm about to read to you right now. And, and one of the reasons your King James won't is because this discovery it, with the Dead Sea Scrolls came after, long after, right, the King James was translated. So sometimes we find new information and it seems like it's new stuff, and we think, well, my old Bible ought to have this better. Well, sometimes when we make a new discovery, it's older than what they had before, right? So the Dead Sea Scrolls are older than anything they had before. But So to kind of get back to the point, to the text, Deuteronomy 32, and if you, if you spend some time in Deuteronomy 32, do it in the ESV or the NRSV. But it says, remember the days of old, consider the years of many generations, ask your father. And so even in Deuteronomy 32, they're saying, this is an old tradition. So they're saying, ask your father here. And he will show you, your elders, and they will tell you. When the Most High gave the nations their inheritance, when he divided mankind, listen to this, he fixed the borders of the people according to the number of the sons of God. So there was a number of the sons of God that he fixed their borders to right? And we're going to show a little bit later how, how, how they rebelled, but fixed their borders. So basically what God did was he took members of his divine council and he delegated them to rule over these nations. And then, right, in verse, in verse 9, uh, I'm going to go ahead and say, I'm going to come back and show you where it shows that they rebelled, but they rebelled. But the Lord, because of that rebellion, the Lord's portion is his people, Jacob, his allotted heritage. So you've got all of these nations around here, and God had given them authority, given authority to the sons of God to kind of rule these nations. And because they rebelled, God chose his own nation, which became Israel, which he was the ruler over. Now, that's going to help us understand some New Testament texts that have been confusing for a long time, but we'll talk about that. Remind me if I forget, remind me about... Uh, uh, the gospel going to the Jews first and then to the Gentiles later, if I forget that when, when, when we get there. But this will help make sense of some passages that have been confusing. Deuteronomy chapter 4, verse 19, look at this. And be aware, lest you raise your eyes to heaven, and when you see the sun, the moon, and the stars, all the host of heaven, you be drawn away and bow down to serve them, 
Okay, yeah, making sure I have that up there right. Things that the Lord your God has allotted, okay? The Lord God has allotted to them uh, under the whole heaven. But the Lord has taken you. So the Lord God has allotted these people to the host of heaven, but he has taken you. taken you and brought you out of the iron furnace out of Egypt to be a people of his own inheritance as you are to this day. Here again, here's another example. Deuteronomy 29, 24. All the nations will say, why has the Lord done this to this land? What caused the heat of this great anger? And I'm going to skip on down because I, I don't want to take all of our time just reading the text. And went and served other gods and worship. He's talking about the Israelites that go and served other gods gods whom they had not known and whom he had not allotted to them. So gods they hadn't known and who God had not apportioned to them or allotted to them. And, and so what we have from looking at the, these passages is that at one time, these were legitimate authorities that God had put over these nations, appointed them by God before they rebelled, this is clear, and I'm going to show you there is a clear text that shows this rebellion. And it might be natural when we read this text, this may be a text that you're familiar with, and you just read over this and never thought that it meant what it did. But now that we know about the divine counsel and what that means, it's going to change the way that you see Psalm chapter 82. So let's just go ahead and look at Psalm 82 and look at what it says here. And we'll just read the whole psalm, but I, I want to read it, and then I want you to tell me what you notice especially when we start with verse 1, where it said God has taken his place in his divine counsel, and then take a look at what happens when we get on down to verse uh, 6 or so. So I'm going to read it, and you just say what you notice about this text. God has taken his place in the divine counsel in the midst of the gods. He holds judgment. How long will you judge unjustly and show partiality to the wicked? Salah, which means peace. Give justice to the weak and the fatherless. Maintain the right of the afflicted and the destitute. Rescue the weak and the needy. Deliver them from the hand of the wicked. They have neither knowledge nor understanding. They walk about in darkness. All the foundations of the earth are shaken. Listen to this. I said... You are, you are God's sons of the Most High, all of you. Nevertheless, like men, you shall die and fall like any prince. Arise, O God. Judge the earth, for you shall inherit the nations. What do you notice about this text? Who is the psalmist talking to? Who is the psalmist talking to? Who is he addressing this to? That's right. He's talking to the sons of God. Now, we may read that and think this is talking about earthly rulers and bad earthly rulers, but it's clear at the beginning. He says sons of God, and then if that doesn't, if that, if, if that doesn't, it's easy to maybe get there and say, well, then he's kind of talking to, to his divine counsel and then we read about all of these things that sound kind of like things unjust, unjust human rulers might do until we get down to verse 6, where it says again, you are God, sons of the Most High, all of, the, all of you, you nevertheless, like men, you shall die. So all of this injustice, right? They're not giving justice to the weak, to the fatherless. They're not maintaining the right of the afflicted and the destitute. God is at this point still imploring these sons of God, members of the divine council, to get in line. Yet they're not. And since they're not, what he says is that you shall die and fall like any prince. Now, what do we know? We know this from Jude. We know this from Second Peter that we know that certain angels, and we know this from Revelation, that there is a place, a portion for them in the fiery pit where they will go and be judged. And we know, according to Paul, that we will judge angels, right? Paul says that. So when Paul says that, what Paul is talking about is not the, the righteous sons of God. He's talking about these rebellious 
sons of God that have fallen, that have done evil, that have led the nations astray, even enslaved them is the way that we'll talk about later. We'll talk about uh, the way that that looks. Now, and you may be thinking, well, this idea of kind of God doing this. Now, remember, when we read God's here, this is really important. Um, we need to recognize that when the New Testament or when the Old Testament says God's, it is not talking. There is not another God other than the Trinitarian eternal God. But often it will use the word Elohim, right, which can be singular or plural to talk about the divine counsel. And so all spiritual beings, God's is shorthand for spiritual beings, okay, when we see the lower G and it's talking about the divine counsel with God. Is everybody tracking with me? So far, okay, I just want to stop and check in because uh, uh, you are a super smart crowd. And I just wanted to make sure that I wasn't running past anybody at this point. Because this is new, I mean, this is new stuff, right? But, oh, Amy? Okay. Yeah, well, we know right, that sometimes when it talks about sons of God and daughters of God, it's talking about us too, because we've been brought into the family of God as well. But when we see sons of God, like in this context, and especially if it looks like it's talking about in the heavenly realm, then that is what it's talking about. Yeah, 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 yeah. We've been, or even Ephesians chapter one, where it talks about we've been adopted into the family that makes us sons of God. And remember, when we talked about from Hebrews last week, that's kind of the cool thing is that actually when we become the family of God, these spiritual counsel, these angels, they become our brothers and sisters, according to Hebrews, which is really cool. But before that, especially when we're talking about divine counsel and it talks about sons of God or when it uses gods with the lower G, we don't need to get all worked up about that. It's not saying that there are multiple gods, eternal, right, eternal, all-powerful God, but any divine spiritual being is referred to as that lower G. That's just short case for, for spiritual being, which we all believe in anyway. So it's not, it's just confusing because of the way that we use the language. Um, but this was not even located just to the New Testament. You know that there were, and I've just got one citation, but there were even people outside of the Old Testament and New Testament that talked about different nations being allotted to different gods. Here's an example. This is from Plato, um, and it says, In the days of old, the gods had the whole earth distributed among them by allotment. Now, sometimes we hear stuff like that, and we kind of get a little bit on edge because we think we're saying, are you saying that the Bible copied this or that maybe it? If we think about it, like we really believe the biblical story that all of creation came from one person, the flood came, and then, especially in that Mediterranean air, area, that basically all the descendants come from Noah, and then we believe this Deuteronomy 32 worldview about how the nations right, were allotted, and guess what? Greece is one of these nations that's in the table of nations from Genesis chapter 10, which is really cool too, but, uh, or at least the area. It's got a different name, but when we look at a map, it covers Greece. It goes all the way to Spain, actually. Um, but wouldn't it make sense if we believe that we all came from the same place, that there might be some of that leftover story distorted as it might be in these other cultures, right? If we all came from the same place. And so to me, when I read from these other cultures and they have stories that look like biblical stories, to me, that's not a knock on what I believe about what God said in the Bible. It actually reaffirms it that more people notice these things and kind of have similar stories outside of the Bible, that confirms what was going on. Um, so let me uh, give you guys another example here. So it's clear in this passage that God is talking from, from Genesis chapter 8, or from Psalm chapter 82, that God is talking to members of the divine council. And we just noted how Plato also noticed this. And let's, let's, we're going to look over here at Daniel now. And I want you to notice that you see this too in Daniel. So we've got in Daniel chapter 10, verses 13, and then we'll go to verse 20. The prince of the kingdom of Persia, Persia, yeah, the, the prince of the kingdom of Persia withstood 
me 21 days, but Michael, and look at the word that's used, one of the chief princes came to help me for I was left there with the kings of Persia. So you've got a prince of Persia, and then you've got Michael, who's called one of the chief princes. Here's another example. Uh, Verse 20. Then he said, do you know why I come to you? But now I will return to fight against the prince of Persia. Guess who this is talking? This is Michael. And when I go out, behold, the prince of Greece will come. So there is Michael fighting against the prince of Persia and fighting against the prince of Greece. In the ancient world, this is what, when when I say the word cosmic geography, what they believed was that when there was an earthly struggle or an earthly battle, they thought at the same time that there was a coinciding spiritual battle going on, right? And even when you read Revelation, you may remember the seven spirits, right, the seven churches, that there was this idea that these geographical areas had kind of coinciding spirits that guarded over them, coinciding angels, spiritual forces, protectors. And right here, there was this idea, there was this prince of Persia. And so what I think, what I'm going to make the argument, and I think we'll make it clear when we get to Paul here in a second, is that uh, these were, this was this idea of the divine council that had been allotted to these other nations, right? Allotted to these other nations and rebelled and led those nations astray. Does that sound too crazy? Are y'all tracking with me? Y'all aren't ready to run me out of here yet? (laughs) All right, good, good. If you feel like you need to run me out of here, then we'll stop and pray, and I'll pick up next week, okay? (laughs) So we got this example in in Daniel, and then I got one more in Daniel chapter... um, Daniel chapter 12, verse 1, where we see it again. Then he said, do you know why I have come to you, but now I will return to fight against the prince of Persia. And when I go out, behold, the prince of Greece will come. Well, I'm sorry, I read the same one. Uh, At that time shall arise Michael, the great prince. Again, Michael, called the great prince, in this cosmic conflict that mirrors the conflict that is coming between Israel and Greece and Persia, which we know that the book of Daniel foretold that conflict. So, okay, here we are again. We've gone through these different difficult texts, this different reading, but when we put these passages together, I think we make a very strong case that God allotted the nations to the sons of God, to the divine council called lower G gods in Psalm 82. They rebelled and led the nations astray. According to Psalm 82, they will be judged and they will die like men. God's own prince, Michael, is seen to fight against the princes of those other nations. So maybe now you're wondering, well, what on earth, what is the connection between all of this and the New Testament? You see, in the Gospels, what we mainly see is Jesus dealing with spiritual powers, and we're talking mainly, as we talked about last week, he's dealing with unclean spirits, evil spirits, and demons. That's the main thing that um, Jesus is dealing with. But when we get to Paul, Paul almost never talks about evil spirits. He almost never talks about demons in that context. He almost never talks about unclean spirits. As a matter of fact, he only uses the word uh, daimonian, I think, four times. And I think it's all in ah, 1 Corinthians 1, if I remember correctly. For, uh, somewhere in the Corinthians. I think it's 1 Corinthians chapter 1. But he only uses the word four times in the New Testament. The word that is used over 50 times in the Gospels is only used four times by Paul. So are you saying... But we, we know enough about Paul. Does Paul talk about spiritual power? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Ephesians talks about, Paul talks about evil and spiritual power a lot. But he talks about it differently. And what the case I want to make to you is that instead of talking about those evil spirits, because when Jesus came and he began exercising uh, 
people and casting those spirits out, what Jesus was doing was showing that he had authority in the spiritual realm, right? And you may even remember that one of those demons, when he cast them out, said, Jesus, son of Nazareth, what are you doing here? Our day has not yet come. So they almost know that they have a day that they're going to be defeated, and they know that it's not yet, right? So Jesus is showing that he is the Messiah, that he has power on earth, and he has spiritual power too by, by casting out these leftover Nephilim, these evil spirits. But Paul is much more concerned with the powers that were allotted, the, the rebellious sons of God. And I'm going to show you the language that Paul uses to describe them. And when you see this, this is going to be familiar. Rulers. And I, I just wrote this in the context on the side. You don't need the, the Greek words, but if you're looking it up, sometimes these will be translated differently, but these are the Greek words that they're attached to on the side. But rulers, principalities, powers, authorities, Powers, again, just a different word for powers. Dominion, lords, thrones, and world rulers. Now you may be thinking, and I don't mean to keep saying what you may be thinking. You may be thinking, well, that, that could just as easily be talking about earthly powers. Like we could say a lot of this about people on earth, about rulers on earth, about principalities, right? Social structures, maybe. About powers and authorities. We have seen powers that we trust in and, and maybe we've trusted in for a long time be corrupted or maybe we still trust in them and we see them being attacked too much right but we recognize this kind of language in the world that we live in or dominion or lords well we may be thinking of english lords and the dominion their their kingdoms so maybe we could make the case just by reading this list that that's not talking about spiritual powers at all but the problem is that paul does not give us that wiggle room Starting first in Ephesians chapter 6, verse 12, look at what Paul says about uh, using several of those words. We've got five of, or, or four of them right here in this one verse. For we do not wrestle against flesh and blood, but against the rulers, against the authorities, against cosmic powers over this present darkness, against the spiritual forces of evil in the heavenly places. And when we look at the way that that's used, it is clear because Paul does a dichotomy, right? He says, we do not, our enemy is not flesh and blood. So he's making it known right here that it's not flesh and blood that we're wrestling against, but it is the spiritual, the spiritual beings that have come into the world and led the world astray. And Paul is, is pretty clear in this passage, but if that's not enough, and I'm, I may not have to be able to use all of my passages here, but let me tell you, there are a lot. I'm going to make a very strong case that Paul is talking specifically about these divine rulers, these rebellious sons of God. Ephesians chapter 3, verse 10, we see it again. Miss Gail um, brought up Ephesians, and it comes up a lot in Ephesians. It comes up in some other, uh, in, in lots of places in Paul, but it comes up a lot in Ephesians. And I cut out, I had eight pages of notes that I spent all day today cutting down to about two and a half. <laughs> so I'm hoping that I can get through. So I'm telling y'all, I cut out a lot to narrow it down to what we have today. But look at Ephesians chapter 3 here, verse 10. Um, so that through the church, the manifold wisdom of God, look at what I've got underlined, might now be made known to the rulers and authorities. Where? In the heavenly places. There is an announcement to the heavenly places. This was according to the eternal purpose that he has realized in Christ Jesus our Lord. Look at this, next passage. So also, when we were under age, we were, look at, look at what it says, we were in slavery. Remember what I mentioned about how these other gods rebelled and they took these other nations and they enslaved them? Well, that's exactly what Paul says. We were in slavery under the elemental spiritual forces of the world. And then in verse 9, so I'm skipping on down from verse 3 to verse 9, but now that you know uh, God, or rather are known by God, how is it that you are turning back to those weak and miserable forces? Do you wish to be enslaved by them all over again? And right here, Paul is talking to a mainly Gentile audience, right? 
because they had been enslaved by these spiritual, these spiritual powers, and now they had come into Jesus, and now they're trying to turn back to them again. We think, why on earth would they do that? But don't we find ourselves turning back to the things we wish we didn't turn back to on a regular basis, right? Even the Israelites, who had been rescued by the true God, find themselves turning back to other gods, which the text says gods they were not allotted to. Right? They were turning to these other gods, these sub-powers under God. Here we go again. Um, yeah, uh, well, I did Galatians 4.9. Oh, sorry, I just I accidentally copied my text there. All right, Colossians chapter 2, verse 8, here we have it again. See to it that no one takes you captive. This is what we read earlier. Miss Gail actually pointed out this passage. Uh, to human philosophy, which depends on human tradition, and the elemental spiritual forces of this world rather than on Christ. And then in verse 20, since you died with Christ to the elemental forces of this world, why, as though you still belong to this world, do you submit to its rules? Right? So something about these Gentile nations being baptized, dying with Christ, set them free from the powers of the spiritual forces in the world. Romans chapter 8, verse 38, again. For I am sure that neither death nor life nor angels, look at how it ties angels and rulers together there. Angels and rulers, oh, I'm sorry. I've got two power, I've got two different power points. I've got it on my laptop where I can see it and I've got it right here too. For I'm sure that neither death nor life nor angels nor rulers. Now, look how it ties angels and rulers together. Now, now, that should, again, maybe if it was just this verse alone by itself, maybe that wouldn't be enough to convince us. But we've seen all of these other verses already so far that have firmly illustrated to us that there is a connection between these spiritual authorities, the rebellious sons of God, which we would say, right, the rebellious angels, the angels that rebelled against God. Nor angels, nor rulers, nor things present, nor things co to come, nor powers. And I've got a few more passages, and then we're going to slow down. We're going to talk just a little bit. Let's see. Oh, I did it again. All right. 1 Corinthians 15, 24, then comes the end when he delivers the kingdom to God, the Father, after destroying every rule and every authority and power, right? So when the kingdom of God, right, when he delivers the kingdom of God will come after every rule and every authority and power has been destroyed again colossians 1 13 another verse he has delivered us look at this from the domain of darkness right domain of darkness think domain where these other uh princes these other powers ruled and transferred us from that kingdom right from that domain of darkness transferred us from that kingdom to the kingdom of his beloved son Ephesians chapter 2, verse 2, in which you once walked following the course of this world, following the prince of the power of the air. Again, right, Daniel, remember Daniel, called princes, right? And here we have the prince of the power of the air, the spirit that is now at work in the sons of disobedience. All right. Last, I want to come back to Colossians chapter 2, verse 8. And in kind of the last 10 minutes that we have, I may take a couple questions, but there's something I really want to kind of lean on that we're going to come back to next week. Because this set up what is a really, what's really cool about what Paul does and what Jesus does in the gospel in connection to these spiritual powers and authorities. But look at chapter 2, verse 8, right? Or, or let me go on down to... Uh, Verse 14, right? By canceling the record of debt that stood against us with its legal demands, 
This he set aside, nailing it to the cross. So in verse 12, right, having been buried with him in baptism in which you were raised with him through faith in the powerful working of God who raised him from the dead, and you who were dead in your trespasses and the uncircumcision of your flesh, God made alive together with him, having forgiven us all our trespasses by canceling the record of debt that stood against us with its legal demands. That we, that we get, right? When we think about our, our baptism and we think about our death, burial, and resurrection, we have no trouble getting to the fact that our sins have been forgiven. I mean, we may have trouble intellectually. We may think about how bad we are and how difficult it is to accept the love of God and the canceling of this debt, but that's something we talk about a lot, right? We talk about the power of the cross, death, burial, and the resurrection to forgive us of our sins, to make us white as snow, to bring us into the kingdom of God. We talk about that a lot, but this next passage also tied to the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus and enthronement of Jesus we don't talk about as much. Because it was through the death, burial, and resurrection. And when we are buried with Christ, right, we also take, take part in this. But through the death, burial, and resurrection, he disarmed the rulers and authorities and put them to open shame by triumphing over them. Does anybody know? Well, before I, before I go there. So we talk a lot about canceling debts. We don't talk about the fact that the death, burial, and resurrection also was Jesus' triumph over these ruling powers. And now we've got a little bit more language to understand what those ruling powers were. So, and we're going to talk about this a lot next week and hopefully clear it up because I'm going to leave y'all hanging just a little bit. But kind of the teaser that I want to throw out there to you is that when Jesus rose from the dead. Anybody know the, the most quoted Old Testament text in the New Testament? Does anybody know what it is? They say that you're not, to ask, you're not supposed to ask test questions like this when you're teaching a class, but I'm going to do it anyway. So does anybody know what the most quoted Old Testament text in the New Testament is? Okay. It may not be what you expect. It's Psalm chapter 110, verse 1, quoted over and over. And it says, the Lord says to my Lord, right? the Lord says to my Lord, sit at my right hand until I make your enemies a footstool for your feet. This is constantly quoted in the New Testament and attributed to Jesus and the enemies that become a footstool, a footstool to the feet of Jesus are the spiritual powers and authorities. That is what Paul constantly ties to them. And when we think of that, we don't need to think just of some king laid back with his feet kicked up on an ottoman. That's not what it means. We should much more imagine that they are at his feet in submission under his feet, and even in such submission that the idea of a foot being on a throat wouldn't be out of place, that Jesus has triumphed over these evil powers to that level, right? He has disthroned them. He has disarmed them. So now, when we think of that, and we think that all of these nations, right, you see, they had a legitimate, when God put them over authority of these other nations, that was legitimate, Right? God gave them the authority to rule over these nations. Then they, then they rebelled, and God said in Psalm 82, I'm going to judge you, and you're going to die like men because you have been unjust. You have not taken care of the fatherless. You have not taken care of the widow. You have not done what you need to do, so you will die like men. But it took the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus to dethrone them. And in that dethronement, what happened was no longer what God did was strip their authority. And that's language that you see used in the New Testament over and over again. God stripped them of their authority through the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus. And by stripping them of their authority, you know what? Now we are free to be servants of God, to be part of God's family because he has taken that authority back away from the powers, the principalities, 
the rulers, these spiritual dark forces that rebelled against God. So when Paul talks about the gospel goes first to the Jews and then to the Gentiles, it's not because God loves Jews more than he loves us, right? It's because the gospel goes to them first because there is no power that God has to disarm for the Jews. The Jews still had sin, and they still needed forgiveness, but they were God's own people. So the gospel came to them first, but it was after the powers were disarmed. See, it was a two-step salvation for us Gentiles because we needed forgiveness of sins too, but we, we needed the authorities that were evil that had enslaved us to be broken so that we could come under the rule of God. And you see, that's what Jesus as the Messiah was. He subdued those authorities, put them under their feet, and that allows all of us, even Gentiles, to become members of the family of God, right? So when we think, and maybe that helps us make a little bit of sense, right? That always was confusing when you get to Romans chapter 9, verses 11, and Paul's really wrestling with this language about the Jews and the Gentiles. It's not that God necessarily prefers Jews over Gentiles. But God made this new nation with Abram out of nothing, right? After all these other nations had been made. So when Jesus died, the Jews were able to have their sins forgiven. But Paul had to go out into the world baptizing these other people and letting them know that the power over them had been broken. And now they were all free to come to Yahweh and to leave these other gods. The text tells us, that those other gods enslaved them. And so even though the people were evil, you get the sense that God is more upset with his divine council members that he gave this authority that abused it, right? But now here we are, the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus allows us, God has dethroned the authorities and allows the entire world to expand the rule of his kingdom and everybody can come to Jesus as Messiah who is now enthroned next to God with the power subdued under his feet. Questions? <laughs> okay. Yeah. 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 Jim asked how, how Satan fits into this. And what I'm going to say, Jim, is just put a pin on that because we're I'm, I'm kind of doing this in reverse order so i'm going to do this next week and then kind of do the second part of this lesson next week and then we're going to talk about satan from beginning to end and show where he fits into this picture because he's obviously a big player here right satan's obviously a big player so uh that's not to avoid your question that's just to say that we'll get to it we're gonna get to it good okay all right carrie ann and then jim Yes. Yes. Yeah. Yes. Oh, that's so good. You you just expressed that so well, Carrie. And I wish I had given you a microphone because you just said that better than I'm going to be able to repeat. So Carrie Ann said that our baptism is more than just following the example of Jesus, the death, burial, and resurrection, and through following this example, receiving forgiveness of sins. But it is also a moment of liberation that frees us from the powers and authorities and these these evil spiritual forces of the world. And she said that, believe it or not, she said it better than I just repeated it back to you. And I would say that's exactly right. That's the power of our baptism, right? That's the power of this gift of the Holy Spirit that God has given us is it breaks the bonds of sin. It breaks these authorities. You see, these authorities have been dethroned and they've been delegitimized, which means that we can, st- we can come back to God freely now. We can get out from under their authority because they don't have that legitimate rule anymore. But they still exist. Their time of destruction has not come yet. And I can't help but think of, I think it's uh, 1 Peter 5.10, Satan roams around like a roaring lion seeking whom he can devour. That sounds like a power that has been dethroned from his territory. And now he's aggressive and he's roaming 
and he's looking for who he might be able to devour, right? And Jim, you had a second question? Okay. Yeah. Yeah. I think the clue is the clue that we get is right here. So we have the person speaking at the beginning who's kind of narrating, and he said, God has taken, so the context kind of helps us out. So it says, God has taken his place in the divine council in the midst of the gods, he holds divine judgment. And then he is recording the speech of God to us. By, I mean, we can see that by the authority that's kind of entailed in this text, by, by looking at what God says in the midst of the gods, he holds judgment. And so when we hear that, we think, well, in the midst of the gods, he may be judging people. And we read down and we read these things. How long will you judge unjustly? Uh, give justice to the weak and the fatherless, maintain the right. So this seems like it could be going to people, but we get the sense, right? It's God, and then he is handing down this judgment. But then it's in um, verse 5 where it switches back that, 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 that we have the clue to exactly who God is talking to through this whole thing. It says, they have neither knowledge nor understanding. They walk about in darkness. All the foundations of the earth are shaken. I said... And here we are, you are God's sons of the most high, all of you. So now we know that that whole thing is attributed to the, these rebellious members of the divine council. So what? That's the narrator. We're back to the narrator again, right? Quotations are God. And then we've got the narrator that's not quotations. Rick? Uh, Rick asked in Revelation where it talks about uh, Jesus hating the, 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 the Nicolaitans. I have to go back, remind me of that, and I'll have the answer uh, next week. I got an idea kind of on the top of my head, but uh, the short answer is I'm not sure. <laughs> so let me, let me, before I say what I'm not sure of, kind of go back and, and remind me, and next week we'll, uh, we'll cover that because it actually will fit in to what we're talking about next week too. I got time. If there's maybe one more question, I got time for maybe one more. And before that, those of you that were online, I forgot to repeat Jim, Jim's question. He was asking in Psalm 82, how do we know uh, who God is talking to and, and who, you know, which one is God? And so we just kind of went through the context of that. Maybe you, you picked up on that, but just in case you didn't. Yeah, yeah. Any other questions? All right, I, got, I got one final illustration for you guys that I think helps. To me, this is a really cool thing. This goes back to a movie. It's one of my favorite movies, one of my favorite stories. But in all the great stories, because I believe all people have the image of God, and I believe the greatest story ever told we find between Genesis and Revelation so all the great stories have that same, kind of have that same storyline, right? The story of kind of people being young and innocent, things going wrong, people rising up against these evil powers, often against these powers. It seems like they've got no hope and they have to struggle their way forward. And then at the end, uh, against all odds, they are able to accomplish the good that they're, gonna, that, that they're meant to do. And so with that, this is kind of one of my, uh, I think this helps us understand, uh, oh, I, I, I'm going to the wrong one. Anybody know what this picture's from? <laughs> That's right. Well, Lord of the Rings, Lord of the Rings. They're, they're closely connected with the Lord of the Rings, and this is a hobbit, right? This is Frodo, and he is holding the ring over the fire of what? Does anybody remember? The volcano. What's the name of the Volcano. Mount Doom, Mount Doom, right? He's holding it over the volcano at Mount Doom. Now, the reason I want to say this and the reason that it's important is because what he has to do is go into the very heart of darkness, the very heart of evil to destroy the evil. And what we're going to show next week is how Jesus does that same thing. 
Jesus goes into the very heart of darkness, the very heart of evil, and it is in that place against all odds in a way that no one expected it to happen, that he is able to destroy the authority, the, the authority and the rule of these dark powers. And so we can say J.R.R. Tolkien was a Christian, but it's not just Christians that we get the same story. But in this, we see something similar, right, where he has to go into the heart of evil to destroy evil itself. And what we're going to look at next week is how Jesus breaks the authority of the powers by going right into the heart of evil in a way that they don't expect. So that's what we'll talk about next week.